call the meeting to order and encourage everybody to bring, um, if you have your PDF or you have a paper version of the agenda, you know, bring that up. Because I, what I'm going to do is try to follow this agenda timing wise. Um, so let's call the meeting to order. It's 10:01. Uh, um, as part of the public process, uh, we're going to actually have a vote on the agenda. So I'm going to ask for a motion for a request to approve the agenda as provided in today's packet and a vote of the board members. So let's take a vote. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Okay. Well, yeah, uh, yeah. One for question that? first. Are we recording? So Christine, yeah. do we have to record every meeting? Yes. Um, okay. okay, I'm going to turn the recording on. And I will take take notes. So let's t let's say uh, who moved who moved the uh, agenda. Holly moved to approve the agenda, and we started at 10:01. Okay. Okay. All the board members in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And who seconded? I'm sorry. Was that? We didn't have a second sure. for a motion to approve an agenda. Okay. And. Uh, now that we are in session, what I'm going to ask is that anybody that is not a board member or that is not in the Giga room to please um, turn your camera off and mute, not turn your camera off, but um, so that you go, if you shrink the, what's the button? Basically to close the camera and mute so that the board members can conduct the board business. We will have a 15 minute public comment section at the end of the meeting. We have a hard stop at 1130 and this is an introductory meeting um, of our board for the Vermont Community Broadband Board and we do not expect to get through every inch and detail um, of all the stuff that we have to get done today. This is a kickoff meeting and we will basically set the table and set the stage for future meetings and excited to see all the uh, public participants but I just want to let folks know that we will open the meeting up at the end of the meeting for 15 minutes for any public comment. All right, so let's move to the second agenda item. Uh, so roll call. Um, so we'll take a roll call of all board members that are really present. Um, we have Dan Nelson, we have Brian Otley, we have Holly Groshner, we have Laura Sibilia, and myself, Patty Richard. Uh, for ground rules, as I said, I'm going to um, start the meeting on time. Each, each, uh, for each meeting that we have, we will plan to start very close to being on time. So I encourage board members to sign on five minutes, ten minutes in advance um, if you're meeting by Zoom, just to make sure the technology is working. And obviously, if you're planning to meet in advance, give your or meet in person, give yourself plenty of parking uh, time in Montpelier so that you get to the Giga Room. Um, and Christine, all, will all meetings be held in the Giga Room? This is yes. Venue? Yep. Yeah. Yes. So parking is limited in Montpelier, so just encourage everybody if you're meeting in person just to plan accordingly. And we are going to skip to the third agenda item, which is board member introductions. What I'd like to do is have each of the members of the board just give a few minutes about your background, who you are, um, and we we have slotted three minutes per person. This is not meant to be, um, you know, a full uh, you know full listing of your resume, so to speak, uh, but just a real high level sense of who you are and a little bit about yourself, and um, uh, that way people that are not aware of everyone's backgrounds, we just are have an opportunity to share. I will start this. I'm Patty Richards. I'm currently the general manager at Washington Electric Co-op. Um, I will not be the general manager in a few months, well, about five months, uh, planning to depart in January. Um, I have been in the electric space for a little over 30 years and have built um, power plants and um, power plant additions and have been part of the uh, public uh, service for the state of Vermont. Uh, through my tenure and working in the electric world, and I'm excited to join the broadband uh, board here and helping to deploy this critical infrastructure. Um, at Washington Electric Co-op, we serve um, electrically some of the most rural areas in the state, 41 towns in the central 
north central part of the state and many of our consumers 75 percent are either unserved or underserved for broadband and inter high speed internet so this whole project is uh, uh you know uh, this whole project meaning broadband deployment is near and dear to my heart in the sense of getting this critical infrastructure to the rural communities uh, that desperately need it. Uh, to me, broadband is like electricity and that it's an essential service, not a nicety. It's not something that you can opt not to have today. We need it for obviously during the pandemic that really exposed the critical nature of having access to internet and high-speed internet um, in terms of healthcare, being able to work, and just being able to uh, exist in our modern society. So um, just that's a few minutes about my background and I will turn it over to, I'm just gonna read off my list of board members. Um, how about Dan Nelson we'll go next? <clears throat> sure, uh, my name is Dan Nelson. I'm the uh, Vice President of Technology for Vermont Electric Power Company. That includes the IT uh, division and telecommunications. Uh, we encompass both uh, IT and OT in our network. Uh, we have an extensive fiber optic network, which I have um, uh, more than 20 years experience uh, planning, constructing, and uh, operating. We also have a statewide uh, radio system covering about 97% of the state, um, dedicated uh, solely for utility purposes and emergency services in that regard. Um, the bulk of my experience has been in network planning construction and operation of those of that infrastructure and um, during the pandemic I would say that uh, I have two two teenage boys and during the pandemic it became very clear to me the divide that occurs when the have with uh, broad, appropriate broadband services are able to access their schoolwork and the have-nots who just don't have anything available to them so there was a very clear drive for um, moving this forward. Uh, for brevity, I guess that's all I'll have. All right, thanks, Dan. Okay, uh, Brian. Uh, Brian Otley. Um, I've got a background in technology. Uh, I've worked for software companies, and uh, I was spent uh, 13 years with Green Mountain Power, most recently as their COO. Um, I've worked with a lot of the uh, broadband providers in the state, uh, so have a good working background of those issues and those challenges. Um, good working relationship with Dan and Velco, as Dan and Velco provide a uh, valuable service in terms of fiber connectivity. On the utility side, um, yeah, I'd echo Dan's comments. The pandemic laid bare the gap. We got to close the gap. The gap's been talked about for 20 years, and it's time to put it to bed. Well said. Excellent. Let's move to Holly. Good morning, everyone, and particularly to Dan and Brian, whom I have not met before. Hello. Um, Holly Groschner, I have about 30 years in the telecom space as an attorney. And at uh, the beginning of my career, I was the young associate who, when someone walked through the door with a cell phone license, said, I don't know what it is, but I want to work on it. So um, I've permitted about 90 of the towers, uh, communications towers in Vermont, went on to be the general counsel for something called Crown Castle International, where I helped acquire and integrate uh, into operations $4 billion worth of wireless network infrastructure. Um, went on to work at the VTA of whom of which you've heard and um, that was a great experience in understanding the tension between public purpose and private contracts and uh, I look forward to working with my colleagues on the board and trying to find a good balance for how we make this really effective. Um, I also uh, had a little job as the CEO of Vermont PBS, the television station, where we sold one of its assets, $56 million worth of spectrum. And um, it was handy to understand media and the telecom space coming into this discussion of broadband. Um, that, uh, that project allowed me, <clears throat> pardon me, to, initiate a little merger between VP of Vermont PBS 
And that was an excellent experience um, from a board management and um, governance standpoint. Um, so I've spent the last year exploring uh, low in the challenges of low income families in getting this very, what everybody agrees is a very essential service, uh, broadband. And I was particularly driven to get involved when I came home from my job in Burlington to work in greater metropolitan Cookville, Vermont. I'm sure you've all been there. It's um, part of the town of Corinth. And I was um, on the phone with my local school principal as she tried desperately to bring people into uh, access to the broadband service that was available, such as it is at Topsham Telephone. So I come to you as a DSL survivor, um, a person in a very rural area, and I really look forward to actually bridging this gap. Thank you. Well, thank you, Holly. And I uh, know exactly where Cookville is. We held a community meeting there a couple of years ago, and that was quite a, a feat to navigate to get there. <laughs> <laughs> like one of those, you can't get there from here and you're on a road that you're not sure that really was a road. <laughs> it was a farm path. And uh, okay, um, last but not least, Laura. Good morning. I'm so excited uh, that we are all meeting. Uh, Laura Sibilia, I'm a resident of Dover, Vermont. Uh, I in, am a legislator from the Wyndham Bennington District, uh, which covers the towns of rural uh, Wardsboro, Dover, Reedsboro, Whitingham, Stamford, Searsburg, and Somerset. Uh, in the off session, I am the director of regional strategies for the uh, RDC in Wyndham County, and I work uh, closely with the RDC and RPC in Bennington County as well. Uh, I am the vice chair of the House Energy and Technology <coughs> Committee and uh, spent a lot of time working with, um, our, with our chair, Tim Briglin, and the committee on Act 79 of 2019, um, which uh, resulted in all of these wonderful CUDs, many of whom I see here today working so hard. Uh, and Act 71 of this year, which created this board. And I am really pleased to be able to work with you all on this next piece. Thank you, Lauren. It's very valuable to have you on this board to help us potentially if we have any um, interpretation issues or what was the intent of the legislature here. So that would be helping very big uh, guide guidance for us as we move along. There's always questions that come up during uh, um, as you get into the weeds of things um, in terms of interpreting acts and what the legislature had in mind. So thank you very much for serving and being on this board. And thank you to all the board members for serving. Um, you know, this is, we are, we are all have the same goal. We all have the same mission to deploy this critical infrastructure. We're excited to get going. Um, you know, like with Christine's uh, hard work and she's going to be the boots on the ground to run this. And as board members, um, you know, and I would like to set the stage a little bit in terms of uh, how we function. Um, board members in general, board members govern and staff do the day to day operation. They're the boots on the ground and deploy. Um, as we get set up in terms of our mission and our, our goals and objectives, we will talk more about this. Today's kickoff meeting, we're not going to venture into the weeds on that, but in general, the, the way I see a board is to um, give guidance and direction um, and the staff under Christine's leadership as executive director is to get the job done. That doesn't mean we're not involved, but we're involved in a different way than a staff person would be involved. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Christine to introduce the staff side of the Vermont Community Broadband Group. Well, I've, with the staff side, it'll be a real simple introduction. We have Rob Fish and Rob uh, uh, yeah, but I'll just say some good things about Rob. Rob has been incredible help to the CUDs. And the CUDs, you know, we all think Rob walks on water. So I'll I'll turn that over to you with those those words. But give, why don't you give an introduction and give a little bit about your background? Thank you, Christine. And I'm excited to be with the board. I'm excited to work with Christine and all of you. Um, my background, I'm coming from the rural broadband. Ooh. I've been working with the CUDs for the past 
year and a half through the pandemic, helping to build these groups and reaching out to Vermonters from all walks of life to form these boards. There's over 300 people who are board members or alternates right now. So I'm excited to continue working with them, to work with Christine, and to move from creating these CUDs to building broadband universally across the state. Excellent. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob. And I'm, I'm happy to be here to help Rob because I know he's been putting in lots of hours and hopefully you can spend less, a few less hours working and more time with your family. So anyway, I, I'm Christine Holquist. I'll give you a little bit about my background. I started my career designing power systems for second largest computer company at the time, uh, Digital Equipment Corporation. And uh, at about age 30, I became manufacturing manager for the startup of these power systems and quickly adopted the uh, Toyota manufacturing process in 1989. Um, and, uh, you know, as an early pioneer of that process, I left digital a few years later and uh, went out and did business process redesign for small and large companies, uh, including companies like Honda and Miller Brewing, um, as well as local companies. Um, but I had an opportunity, you know, I was hired by Vermont Electric Co-op while they were in bankruptcy to help them with their business process redesign in 1998. Uh, ultimately had an opportunity to become their opportunity an operations manager in 2000. Of course, I didn't know the utility business and I was thrilled to learn something new. Um, so jumped in and uh, 2005 became the CEO. We were very active in implementing the smart grid. We rolled out smart meters in 2005. But all that time, starting in 2003, the board kept asking me about getting broadband to rural Vermonters. So evaluated technologies, ran lots of business models, um, and then, of course, you know, really enjoyed that job and that career in the co-op world. But in 2018, out of an act of passion for uh, passion for our democracy, and maybe in, and maybe it was a symptom of aging as well, but I decided to leave and uh, made the uh, made the uh, yeah, well, the strange decision to run for governor. Um, became the Democratic candidate. Uh, of course, you know, I've, I. I have tremendous respect for Phil Scott, so uh, it was a great campaign. But I, afterwards, I went up to uh, Canada to chase a porous silicon battery with a gentleman by the name of Don Nasanka, who built the first lithium ion battery factory. Unfortunately, this porous silicon battery, we were not able to upscale it for utility grid purposes. So uh, I went to take care of my mom for a few months in Syracuse, got a call from the CUDs and said, yeah, I'd love to help doing that. And uh, ultimately, I was pleasantly surprised when the governor called and asked me to do this for the state. So I, I really have a, I really think this is so important. You forgive my bias, but I think it's, you know, humankind has done great things. We're capable of doing great things. The electrification of rural America was, in my opinion, one of humankind's greatest works. And I think we're about to embark on that equally great work here. So thank you for the opportunity to work with all of you. Terrific, thanks, Christine. And uh, Christine, as part of uh, Act 71, there is provisions for uh, staffing. Um, can you comment at all? Is it too soon to comment about staffing plans at the department in terms of your group to staff up? Uh, no, it, it is not uh, too early. In fact, we've got to give it, Rob and I have done a lot of work on this. Um, we do, you know, think that there's there are some areas of support that the CUDs need, and I'll quickly tick those off. Uh, first of all, you know, and I, I would hope we get to this in very quickly and in our first deep dive meeting. And I'll just kind of give you uh, in some foreshadowing of what we're thinking about. Um, obviously, we would we want to provide legal support, so uh, we need we need that uh, that resource. We need, uh, we want to provide grant administration and finance support. GIS support is important uh, from our standpoint. Um, what did I miss, Rob? Uh, legal support. Legal, yep, yeah. So we, we've put together uh, a straw proposal, uh, which we'll bring to the first deep dive board meeting. Uh, engineering. Uh, yes, engineering, thanks. Uh, great. 
And I'll just echo again what I stated in the beginning is that this meeting is really a kickoff meeting. We're not intending to get into the weeds on anything at this point. We're, um, we were required to have a gathering of the board um, in this, within the structure of the Act 71. And we are meeting that meeting by hold or meeting that requirement of the statute by holding this meeting. So this was really a kickoff uh, cursory meeting. And I just will a couple of things I'll state um, in that um, pieces and the work uh, things are in the works on Christine's end that obviously this is a public meeting and we have well over 30. It looks like uh, 34, 35 people from the public attending right now. And I anticipate that as we get going, there'll be more and more interest from the public to attend. So anything that we put in writing by email is subject to public disclosure. So very, we have to, I want everyone to have the mindset of, of transparency. Uh, obviously these meetings are gonna be taped and recorded, whether we're doing them by Microsoft Teams or some other venue, everything will be recorded. Uh, but our emails will migrate over to uh, vermont.gov email system um, for now we will all use our current emails that were that we have uh, provided to communicate but anything that we put together relative to the Vermont Community Broadband Board is subject to public disclosure so just uh, you know make sure to remind people of that um, Christine do you have an update as terms of when uh, we would have emails available to us from the state yeah I, that will happen within two weeks. Yeah. Um, other ground rules that I'll just uh, remind folks of <clears throat> is in the event we are talking about anything that or any type of business association that you may have a conflict of interest with or have some sort of like at Washington Electric Co-op, I will be very uh, uh, transparent and disclose if there's a CUD that I'm working with currently in my role in my hat at Washington Electric Co-op and I want to make sure that we have that in mind as we move ahead is to disclose so that we can vet to figure out if anybody needs to recuse themselves from a discussion or if just a disclosure is necessary so I'll just put that reminder out to everybody that that's going to be really critical important we don't know who everybody is dealing with on a individual basis and I you know I'm very conscious of the fact that I'm employed at Washington Electric Co-op we are looking at broadband and I want to be super critical that we are squeaky clean as we move forward. So I just want to put the plug out for full disclosure. Christine, I mean, Pat, Patty, yes, that, that standard is applicable to staff as well. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. I know we're moving fairly rapidly through, but I'm just uh, trying to be very diligent about time. <clears throat> In the event we are uh, ahead of schedule, we'll leave more room for public comment. But as I've said, we're planning for public comment at the end of this meeting for 15 minutes at least. And we will take uh, that set. When we've gone through our agenda, we will open that up. Okay, so we have done board introductions, staff introductions. So let's move to uh, the officer's seat of vice president, vice chair. We are required to nominate and vote on a, a vice chair position. Is there anybody that's interested? I'm gonna do this on a voluntary basis first, and then, then we'll nominate you. <laughs> And Christina, I don't know if you've had any dialogue with anybody at this point. And I, I have not had any dialogue with anybody at this point. I, I just thought Dan right. Nelson would be an excellent vice chair. Okay, so nominated. And I would nominate Laura Sebelia. Oh, we have two. Now we're going to have a debate. This is going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> Dan and Laura, are you interested? Uh, I am honored. Thank you, Holly. Um, but I would like to decline. Um, and I think Dan would be a fine choice. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. That was a, that was a decent debate. <laughs> that, was, that was very gracious. And Dan, I can see that you definitely want this. Dying for this opportunity, and I am honored. <laughs> Just dying. <laughs> okay. And you 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 would be willing to serve then? 
as vice chair, sure. I think that's Excellent. a great idea. Excellent. I will I will try my best not to miss meetings, Dan. I promise. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, can we have a nomination or a, a motion from the floor? I'd Dan, like to second like it. Listen. I'd like to second it. Okay. Dan, glad to know you now. <laughs> All right. And I put the motion forward, so I'm the, I'm the motion. Uh, Holly seconded. Let's have a vote of the board. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Dan, you are officially the vice chair. Thank you. Thank you. And we uh, we are required to have a vice chair. We are not required to have other officer seats, but in the event that we need them, we can take that up uh, at a later date. Um, so just for now, we've we've uh, concluded the requirements of X71 in terms of filling that vice chair position and officer seats. Okay, next agenda item, I'm going to turn it over to Christine to do a update from her seat as the executive director. Okay, great, thanks. And this is all captured in the packet that I sent you. But uh, I spent the first two weeks uh, meeting with uh, as many telecom providers as I can, large and small, uh, as many CUDs as possible. Um, and I plan on wrapping up those meetings in the next week uh, and really to get a uh, to hear from the, those uh, telecom providers and the CUDs where they are and what their perspective is and what how we can help from the from the VCBB. Also met with some individual towns. Um, so you know if I if I I'll start by saying what what I've learned from those meetings is um, there's clear I'm gonna and I, I I like to talk about the value added activities of the uh, CUDs and the value added activities of the Vermont Community Broadband Board. And what I propose is that the value added activities of the, uh, of the CUDs is really to get, to get the network designed, get the network built, work with their communities, and really and, and develop the appropriate partnerships in order to accomplish the goals that have been identified in Act 71. Our job at the VCBB, our value added becomes in creating as smooth a grant administration process as possible, developing you know, standard reporting and standard forms for those, uh, and we'll take on the necessary bureaucratic work in order to respond to those. Uh, we'll, we'll provide the financial support and financial resources. It's not clear to me, we haven't had the detailed discussions yet of how much of that finance work we could take on. We could take on, I, I guess I would, I think for most uh, to be most productive and most efficient on accomplishing those goals, I think you know we we should provide the maximum amount of financial support as possible, up to the point of accounting and and uh, budget management as well. Working with those CUDs, um, legal same thing. You know the legal issues that the CUDs are facing are generally the same, so we we ought to be able to come up with pretty standard templates um, for those legal issues. Um, uh, I, and as, as far as uh, engineering and GIS services, uh, I, I see us uh, providing a statewide, uh, looking at it, working with the existing fiber providers such as Velco and uh, First Light and others to build a ring, uh, uh, engineer the ring around the state, engineer where those CUDs and those towns and those uh, telecom providers uh, connect to that ring, uh, and also try to bring and already have said, had some confidential discussions with other outside providers in you know large providers from outside our area and in the, in the New England region to bring additional data to Vermont. So with the goal of driving down the cost of bulk data rates. So our engineering focused on the Vermont level and the region level in looking at redundancy and resiliency and working with the CUDs and the telecom providers to make those proper connections uh, and, and to review their engineering plans to ensure their engineering brings resilience and redundancy, as well as uh, consistent with the Vermont telecommunications plan. In that vein, you, you will see that we've, we've started to make quite a comprehensive list of attributes that we recommend that uh, we review the um, grants against. That list has grown quite a bit. Uh, I've shared that with uh, as many 
as many uh, groups as possible, including the CUDs, uh, as well as the uh, state agencies like the DPS, and um, welcome the administration's input on there. Welcome everybody's input onto those those uh, attributes. And ultimately, the, that'll get to one of our key board discussions that that doesn't necessarily need to happen in the next next week or so, but early on, we you know we'll we'll try to reduce the number of attributes that we look at in deciding that. But ultimately, we're going to have to weight those attributes. And we'll be very public about how we're going to be issuing those grants. We've already been very public about it in terms of what the attributes they'll be weighed, weighed against, as well as the requirements. Um, uh, and that's defined in the board packet as well. So that so we've done a lot of work around uh, identifying those attributes because you know we're dealing with lots of money here and we want to be uh, as public and try to be as you know uh, as fair as possible in making those decisions so um, you know as we talk we talk about um, uh, then talking about uh, uh, reporting and how do we you know how how do we ensure that we're responsibly uh, using these taxpayer funds um, uh, the next level of thing that we, we all should work on together is really the, the key performance indicators that show us our progress, you know, measuring the appropriate things and reporting those appropriate things and being very sensitive and careful to what those measures are, because sometimes measures have unintended consequences. Um, but some of those measures, for example, might be percent of underserved addresses connected, uh, total cost per address passed, cost per mile, cost per megabit per second combined, upload and download, take rate, low income area service access, um, and some of the early KPIs. These KPIs will evolve over time, but early on we want to you know, look at the addresses that are covered by high level design, addresses that are covered by detailed design, uh, on time connection rates, for example. And then there's there will be confirmation KPIs, which one time and ongoing at actual address performance and those will be really based on what the FCC has already done a lot of work on, but initial connection speed, initial latency, and then an, on a speed and latency over time. Um, I should probably pause before I keep going because I now realize I'm going very fast here. Uh, so I'm gonna pause, I think I'll pause and take some questions at this point because then I'll move into what I propose for what we're looking at for a proposed grant process. So I talked about um, you know, the, the KPIs, the key attributes, what questions does the board have? Pat, Patty, you're muted. Patty, you're muted. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, why don't we do this? Do it this way. Raise your hand on the video. So anybody who has a question, Laura, go ahead. Yeah, Christine, uh, I'm uh, trying to follow along with you here, and I did read this all this morning. Did you get to the reporting uh, to the administration part yet? Uh, I skipped over that, but it is an appropriate question to ask right now. Okay, great. Uh, so I'm just interested in, I noted the weekly nature of that, um, and so I'm just interested in, um, what um, what the expectation is for reporting at a weekly level. If you have a sense of that or if that's something that um, has been, you know, specifically requested um, that would be reported weekly. Yeah, that's, in that's interesting. And I'm glad you're asking that question, Laura, because I'm not sure I fully understand the legislation versus the, uh, versus the administration request. Um, and first of all, I should start by saying my plan is to issue a weekly report to the board and to the public anyway, because things can change so quickly. In this, mm -hmm. So there, there's no problem with doing a weekly report. I think that's important. What, what we need to figure out is the administration is looking for, you know, key, key look, and they're looking for input from us to say, what are those, and it ties to the KPIs, which I'm, Happy with KPIs? Do I love KPIs? So, so the idea is, you know, how how can 
the administration tie this into their all of their overall goals and strategies and what kind of uh, measures for success? Um, there, this report will you know will go up through June uh, and into the administration. And again, that becomes the question around. I'm not sure. And you, since you were part of the uh, the uh, process of uh, putting this legislation together, I'm not sure how much that firewall should exist between the DPS and the Vermont Community Broadband Board. If that is an issue, we should probably put it on the agenda for a, a later board meeting. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that it is an issue. I will tell you the nature of my question is really wanting to understand. So, you know, if we're looking for reporting on um, address level data weekly, that feels different than kind of a summary of, you know, uh, what's been happening around the state and neither necessarily being, you know, correct or incorrect, but just, you know, a different level of detail and, and work. And so. Uh, how can we best help you with this? Yeah, that, well, I think that's uh, ultimately what I, I will, uh, uh, what Rob and I will do is we'll kind of put together a set of recommended KPIs and then bring that to the board. And then, of course, the board value, you know, you've got some, we have some tremendous experience as the board is to say, you know, you know, are these appropriate? What others should we be looking at? Um, are we looking at too many? The danger sometimes is looking at too many. I like to say there's three to five good key performance indicators and everything should waterfall from that. There's also some indicators that are required by the ARPA funding at the federal level. So I think that is what is being integrated into what the reporting requests on a weekly basis is that's coming down from, from the administration. That's helpful, Rob. Thanks. Holly. So I'm not sure I understand the firewall discussion, but I think we ought to have it when we have our longer meeting just to be um, fully informed as a, as a board. I also think that there's a conversation to be had. I, Christine, I support you in the idea that too many indicators just means that the data gets very dense. And um, we really need to have some simple rules of thumb that we can communicate not only to the administration but to the public and so um, in order to do that i'm wondering how comfortable you feel about our baseline um, one of the things that we're trying to report here is have we made progress and in order to do that we have to have some agreement about what our baseline is so um, have there been thoughts about that Yes, I have thoughts about that. Um, we're, you know, the 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 state has a broadband um, broadband status by E911 address. My belief that's greater than 80% accurate. There are certain pockets and that, and uh, certain pockets in certain towns that are covered by certain providers where the data is much less accurate. But overall, I think it's a relatively accurate index. Um, the the uh, in Act 71, it states that the department has the responsibility for updating that database on an annual basis. Um, you know, it's 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 it may not be the perfect benchmark, but it's the benchmark we have. And so, you know, Rob and I continue to work from that database, and we continue to have the discussion. Um, but Rob has done, and we can talk about that some later board meetings done. Uh, Rob has done some comparison data to see, you know, how, how, uh, what our confidence level can be in making decisions based on that database, and we can have, we'll, we'll be prepared to talk about that. Yeah, the data, uh, data set. See, the data set will be updated for the to include the 2020 data uh, towards the end of this year is when the processing is expected to be from the information I've been able to glean for new data in addition to the 2019 data that we're currently working off of. And that's the 2019 data, but also all the projects that were funded via the 2020 Connectivity Initiative, the line extension programs, cut supplemental grants, taking into account locations that are included in RDOF. Uh, so it's, we have a lot of data that we're working to crunch. Uh, 
Christine and Rob, would it make be would it make sense to add to the next agenda, next meeting that we have is is kind of a presentation on the baseline issue. So we have the Magellan report that did a really nice widespread look at the state of Vermont. And again, I, I acknowledge that that's a couple of years old now. Um, and Rob has uh, access to data in terms of a database that the DPS has. Maybe just do, I think it's a re it would be a really good thing to add this to our first deep dive meeting, where we're starting from. Just visuals and maps and gearing it to high level, not into the gory weeds numbers and stuff, but just high level big picture where we're starting from. What are the areas? How many numbers in the state do we have that are underserved? Like I know in Washington Electric Co-op Service Territory, 75% of our membership is underserved by internet access. It'd be nice to know that for the entire state. So I propose we tag this for a, a deep, you know, bigger picture presentation for uh, the first board meeting to go over this. Yep, happy to oblige. Excellent. Brian. Is the, and the presumption is, is that I think it's the DPS that maintains that data. Yes. yes. That, that that will be the baseline, the source of baseline going forward, right? We're not going to get into competing baseline sources, right? No, that that is the source of data. Right. That's that remains with the department. That right. does the telecom plan right. and getting everything. So Perfect. Sorry. Good point. Very good point, Brian. All right. Any other questions, comments? Christine, did you have more that you wanted to tee up? Yeah, I, I, I took a pause there. Um, now sure. I'll, I'll, I'll get it to a, a call. I will call that a, a mid presentation break. Um, the, uh, the, it, it, we're working on the proposed grant process. Um, and I, I was very impressed with working with uh, the administration, uh, uh, namely Doug Farnham, a uh, pretty, pretty skilled uh, person in terms of looking at these. And I say that because you know, Doug's trying to reconcile the federal ARPA requirements versus the Act 71 legislation requirements and how do we set up a standard reporting. But um, that said, the plan is that, you know, we, this 150 million that's allotted, we're, take, we're, we're in the process right now of, of uh, doing, doing what's called a, an RFP to get $30 million for pre-construction, which will include design engineering, uh, as well as uh, support, you know, staff st supporting the staffs at the CUDs. Um, it, it's my view that we need to get to detailed design engineering as quickly as possible. A few of the CUDs have not yet done high-level design, so we're going to push that as quickly as possible. That'll come out of the pre-construction budget, um, and that's a, that'll be one allotment. The other allotment, the remaining 120 million or so, and I, forgive me if I. I may not have these numbers entirely right, but um, will be uh, uh, available in one grant. Um, and from there, we will, you know, I, what I suggest uh, as a process is that we, we issue the RFPs to the CUDs and uh, include, include the, the required state and federal uh, questions. The grant applications will be reviewed by staff uh, you know, I'll sign off on those and bring those to the uh, board for approval. Once the board approves of those grant, we'll, uh, we'll do a, uh, a grant agreement with those CUDs and towns and possibly telecom providers, I should add. And then, of course, we'll, we'll, we'll establish, we'll have established by that point, the ongoing grant management and reporting required by the CUDs, towns and telecom providers who are recipients of these funds. So that's uh, any questions on that before I change the subject. Christine, do you have time a time target? You're looking at the 30 million for pre-construction and the 120 million for, you know, basically it's broadband deployment at that point. Yes, uh, in fact, Rob and I, we we would have liked that pre-construction funding yesterday. So we've been somewhat aggressive working that process, uh, and. Uh, so that's, and the reason for that is because I would like to see all the detailed designs completed by the end of the year from the CUDs. And that's also a tall order as well. But, you, but we really don't know what we've got until we get those detailed designs done. And then, you know, we can move into construction 
but the designs are really uh, and are really the ground truthing, uh, some level of ground truthing. Again, it's not, you don't really get true ground truth until you do the make ready. But but it's certainly you know you look at high level designs. The high level designs are really a rough view. Uh, we get a much more detailed view at the detailed design, but you really don't know final until you get make ready. And of course, the make ready process could be as long as 105 days, according to 3.700. You know, so so the um, so that you know that that if we want to get these things built as quickly as possible, we really have to move to design as quickly as possible. Did that answer your question? No. Yeah. So I think it yeah. just, it answered in general. But I think we should, we need to work on, again, we're, we're hitting the ground early here and running, but that's something we will need to nail down with more specificity, especially the 120 million, like what we're targeting. And I'm just, I'm not suggesting that this is a date, but by March of 2022, I don't know what the timing is, but we need to be, I think for the CUDs and anybody who's interested in these funds, We'll need to work on that timing to be a little bit more specific. Holly, you had a oh, question? Oh, of course. Yeah. The, the reason why I say no is just um, I'm unclear whether there is a grant process that sets objectives and pulls out uh, deliverables from the legislation that for the 30 million that is being contemplated to start before you know, before board approval, I mean, I think it's very important that we ensure that we're all on the same page with regard to core objectives. And I can understand why design, you'd want to move as fast as you can to get to design, but design is the cornerstone, right? So um, you've talked a lot, Christine, about redundancy and um, the kind of integrated, I'll call it an integrated network that um, might be beneficial to the state. That's a whole subject area of discussion that requires some design coordination, right? So I'm just saying that I as a board member know what some of the basic premises are that you're putting into that design phase. Oh, I, I naturally expected that discussion, so. Okay. Okay, great. I just, you know, I feel for the CUDs. I know that that they want to get moving. So I guess I'll turn turn my concern back over to our chair and say, so when are we meeting again? Yeah. <laughs> Brian. So on the design thing, so in my experience on this, if you give the detailed design, if you give two telecom engineers the same problem, you get two different designs. So um, my question is going to be, how are we? And, and then I have seen designs uh, developed with good intent that are then when they go to the stage of being transferred to the to the entity that's going to actually do the build, they want to then redo the design and re and recheck it or modify it or whatever. So every single modification handoff transfer is what is in my mind wasted dollars and wasted time. So I think we need to spend time talking about when these detailed designs are done and fu are funded and then performed. Like there has to be a connection back to whether it's the CUD or a different telecom um, who's going to do the build that they are going to accept either it in its entirety or a large percentage of it. So we're not spending dollars several times to get the same outcome. Yeah, thank, thank I want to thank you for bringing that up because here's the tension. And, and you and you should know I came into this job. I my bias was doing was doing a centralized state design of a fiber network. But the reality, you know, is as we get into this, it, it, we, we have to balance and and again I think this is a you know, excellent in-depth core discussion that we should have because this is there's definitely tensions on both sides and 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 I think uh, Brian has described uh, accurately one of the risks we run um, by you know by by we run this risk that a lot of a number of the CUDs are really far along 
and we'll be we'll be stopping those CUDs dead in their tracks. Um, and some are some it won't be a problem at all. And I guess Rob, maybe uh, you can give. I'd love to hear your thoughts too on this. Sure, I can give a, a little bit of an overview, but. Uh, Several CUDs have chosen or are closing in on closing who their operator is going to be. So this is who the professional company that has built these networks before is going to be building out in their area. Uh, there's a, a concern about stopping the process now or redoing stuff that has been done before. But I think there is general agreement that we do need some type of high level design, some type of engineering to ensure redundancy, to ensure resiliency to ensure these networks are connected. I don't know if that provides a little bit of comfort and a little bit of background on what the tension, the tension is. Yeah, and with that said, I do think this is a very important discussion that we should have early on. So, and in the bill, uh, there is a clause in the bill that gives us the ability to do a high level design. It's not a requirement to do a high level design. Right. I just want to make sure that as we take those steps, there's value to it because there's there's having a high level design may have optical value or political value, but does it have does it have construction value? And and yeah, yeah. you know, I'm confident we can manage the optics and the political because it's been going on for 20 years. <laughs> I'm much much more interested in in like if we're spending dollars on design, does it have construction value? Um, and then will the entity that's either going to do the build or will sponsor the build, will they accept that design or, or a large part of it? So they're not then we're not then seeing competing designs come out later and, and requests for funding on those. Yeah, and let, let me add an exclamation point to what Brian just said. You know, when we looked at, well, we, we built a, a really good model at uh, NEK in terms of serving the uh, 40, uh, 57 towns. And which represent 25% of the other, 23% of the unserved addresses in the state. And our cost of design was 6.2 million. So you, if you extrapolate to that state, you know we're talking, you know, a, a literally probably close to 30 million dollar investment in design. So it is a very important item that we all come to, you know, come to agreement on. So I, so certainly, you know, we're not going to do anything until the till we meet as a board and, and and come up with a policy on this. I should also say that the groups that haven't embarked on high level design are doing so in collaboration with a potential operator. Uh, others are doing it in terms of giving them the knowledge they need to negotiate with potential operators. Partners. Well, I've, this is really helpful. This is great discussion and I've added a, uh, a potential agenda item as a as it listed as core objectives of the VCBB of engineering and pre-construction work. So all nice. this detail, uh, we should lay out what is the design. I'm going to call it script. And I've got this written up, uh, Christine, so I can send this to you. Design script. We want to assume all the networks are connected. How is that going to be um, listed in, this, in these core objectives? How we integrate all the CUDs together? And how we're not, um, and not holding somebody up who's already way ahead of the game and you know, they've, they're ready to deploy and already have their design work all done. So we can list this as uh, for the next deep dive meeting that we have identifying these core objectives, because that gives us as board members things to evaluate um, proposals against when we deploy funds to make sure we're hitting our objectives. Thank you. And I, so yeah, and and I I think we you know that I think um, I think this is the the probably I would propose this is the top priority to focus on right now, um, because it's create there's so much tension out there and it really that tension goes all the way down to the Vermonter who's underserved and unserved. We get you know we get so many calls from people to say when am I going to get connected right? So this so this is a really important discussion. Thank you. Agreed. Um, and we want to do it right the first time. <laughs> yes, accountability is key here. We want to make sure this works. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, um, all right. So the other part of this, which really gets uh, the last part of my presentation, 
really is to the grant selection criteria, which will, you know, some of these uh, things we talk about will be will be added or modified to that criteria. But we have a, a, a large list of grant uh, proposed grant criteria, as well as draft uh, grant conditions. I'm not going to take you through that list here uh, because it's, uh, it's pretty extensive, but I'd like you all to you read it, study it well, think about some uh, conditions or criteria we might have missed, look for redundancy, and ultimately think about how we weight those. Now, the, cri the, the, uh, the conditions aren't going to be weighted. Those are requirements. But the grant criteria will weight and use a decision matrix. And that, you know, using that decision matrix will be a way we can communicate fairly what, what the, how those decisions were made in terms of uh, issuing those grant funds. And, and just to specify, this is we're talking about the construction funds. Construction. For the actual building of projects, not the pre-construction side of things. So it's, it's, yeah, it's because important we, to make sure we're separating those two programs. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Um, and I should also say that another, you know, in my, in my meetings with, the, I just want to highlight that there's a tension between the CUD. I mean, this is probably self-evident, but there's a tension between the CUDs and a tension between the private providers. Um, it, the, the, you know, this, in many cases, the, the private providers were given opportunities to respond to the RFPs, and they chose not to respond. On the other hand, I must confess, you know, as, as one, as one uh, provider said yesterday, hey, I got the 74-page RFP. You know, it was ridiculous, all the details in there. I said, yeah, I wrote that. Um, so the po <laughs> point being, I understand that that was a difficult RFP to respond to, and I know that other CUDs may have copied that. Um, and so, um, but if, so what I'm encouraging the telecom providers, the local telecom providers, to reach back out to their to their CUDs and talk about how we can work with them. Because I, uh, you know, it, I don't think our intent is to put the local providers out of business. I think our intent is to see how we can help. Um, so, and naturally, what you hear from the local telecom providers is, "Hey, if you gave us this money, we would have done it ourselves." Um, you know, so so that tension exists. Um, that and uh, that there's some there, uh, like anything else, there are various levels of performance with local providers. Some I wouldn't want to use either. Others, you know, we would want to support. Uh, so I don't know. You know, we have to figure out how to deal with that tension and how, what our policies are and how we do grant selection. And then the other part of that is there are some towns, and the Act 71 allows for this. There are some towns that have that are really uh, moving further ahead and have have already just started to develop some plans with local local providers, and there's pretty well thought out plans. However, you know, with the design considerations are, are have not been uh, uh, discussed. So that's the end of my presentation. Uh, any other thoughts, concerns, or feedback? Any comments <clears throat> from the board? Questions? Okay, as I said, I've written down several items that are uh, at some point will be agenda items for either next meeting or a soon to be held meeting. We have we have a lot to accomplish um, in the next months, and this may be good timing to bleed into the agenda for next meeting and when do we meet. Um, and what I'd like to do is just tee up some things I've written down and then open it up to folks in terms of agenda items. I have listed in addition to kind of that high level overview of where we're starting from in terms of that baseline um, doing a report to get a lay of the land for the whole state um, a, a proposal to at least look at the arpa funding kpis and, and start looking at those because i think those are going to be important to hold feet to the fire here it's not only that we need to be public and fair but we also need to be accountable and those KPIs will help us to become accountable and be accountable. Uh, firewall discussion I have listed as an agenda item core, and the core objectives of the VCBB for engineering and pre-construction and that list that I rattled off. 
I've also have grant selection policies as agenda items. That I don't think that we'd be able to accomplish all of this in the next meeting. These are things that we're going to have to tee up in the next handful of meetings. Uh, I apologize, but could you re repeat again what your first uh, bullet, first item was? ARPA funding KPIs. Yep. So okay. The first, bullet, the first bullet was the baseline. Where we're starting. Baseline. Okay. Great. And Christine, I will send you this list. That's that off quickly. Great. Thank you. Anybody else have other things to add? Miss anything? Nothing more. Okay. So, from a staff, from, sorry. Go ahead. Hey, from a from a staff perspective, and from what I've been hearing from the CUDs, getting additional pre-construction funding out the door is a priority. So I ask if if the board wants to review the RFP process and the RFP before it is issued, that that should. I recommend that being a priority and happen happening really soon because we are expecting the go ahead from from the administration and guide house really soon. Okay, so let's definitely tee that one up for the next agenda. Next next meeting. <clears throat> I think the baseline and that RFP process probably are the two critical things that our next meeting and we'll pile on as much as we can. actually holding things up. Yes. Okay, so can we um, can we now pick uh, a meeting to come and a standing meeting date? I'm going to propose we meet every two weeks, at least for temporarily until we get kind of grounded and then we can pull back from that if need be. But I think there's so much to be done here that we should be planning to meet every two weeks. Um, I think two hours is probably too short because of how much we have to do. So I would suggest we plan for three to four hours. That sounds overwhelming, but um, to the extent that staff can support us and, and do this, that's what I'm proposing, that we block up four hour meeting chunks and push through this. Laura. That sounds great. Uh, I would just throw out for consideration. Um, I would like to attend in person whenever possible. It will be easiest for for me to do so. It's a it's a two hour travel for me. The if it's early or late, so that I you know perhaps have half a work day at my regular job. Agreed. Won't be a deal breaker. And of course, I'm assuming we can participate virtually if need be. So. Yes, I would like to make this as accessible. All the meetings that we have, I'd like to make accessible virtually um, to the extent that we can attend. That's preferred, but absolutely understand that you know many of us are traveling and we may be away having to attend meetings from other states. So absolutely virtually. Um, and I'd like that suggestion of either a morning block or an afternoon block. One thing in terms of feedback with pre-construction, like if this decision point is something that is holding things up. Uh, if this, if Christine is amendable and the board is amendable, potentially we could also meet the middle of next week and then go two weeks from there. We are going to be running into some vacation issues. Sorry, I am finally going away for the first time in the pandemic the next week. So I love you all, but. <laughs> so, That's good. That. It's important to get some away time. I completely understand that. <laughs> Yeah, I suppose middle next week works for me. I, 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 I heard Rob say, I, I thought I heard Rob say he's away next week, but yeah. then encouraged us to meet next week. I'm, I'm a little confused. <laughs> I'm not that evil. I'm here next week, except for Friday, and then I'm gone the following week. So I will be available next week. Uh, potentially next Wednesday would allow us to still do the 48 hours. Uh, notice that we we must provide if we are going to be meeting. So that is Wednesday the 11th. I'm could we sure. make it? Could we make it Thursday the 12th? As when I'm just not available at for the two hours in the middle of the morning. I'm worried I can um, make this block. Um, I would I would put a dent in the block. Double could it be that. Thursday? That'll, I can well, do Thursday if Thursday we do the afternoon. 
the 11s and 12s are terrible for me. I'm going to be out of town on work and traveling, and it's going to be brutal. 10th? 10th. You say? 10th is great for me. Yeah, we, can get, we, get the we, can get, we can get the notice out today. Oh I could do the 10th as well. All right. Is that amenable? Does the 10th work? Okay. Yeah, Patty, uh, may you just send me the uh, proposed agenda items and we'll put it together and get a notice out. Do folks prefer morning of the 10th or do they prefer the afternoon? Morning would be way easier for, for me personally. I'll support that. Okay, let's do morning. Um, and that gives us enough time for notice? Yes, we'll get that notice out today. Does a 9 a.m. start time work for folks? It gives time to somewhat travel. You know, it's a little early, but for those of us that are traveling over an hour. Nine is fine for me. I would also meet earlier. Just put that I would, I would meet. I second Laura's sentiment. Earlier is fine also. And one thing the board be may want to consider is actually doing this meeting around the state over time since there'll be members of the public that would love to attend in person that are, are not in Montpelier that wouldn't want to drive three hours um, as a, a future thing to consider. Okay. I, I would like us to talk about the value of that, Rob. I understand the desire, but I, I think we should talk about that. Have, having run an organization where the caravan of meetings became an all consumptive thing. <laughs> okay. But so I could, I could make earlier on Tuesday if people want to start at eight. Okay, I'm going to propose 8:30 because it is over an hour for me traveling. So just I'm going to be a little selfish and propose 8:30 to make sure I get there on time. Should I bring in lunch? I think that's a good idea to have some something to snack on and conclude with a lunch. That'll be our that'll be our reward or treat. <laughs> Is there coffee there? <laughs> there will be coffee. Yeah. All right, so we have the morning of August 10th, starting time at 830. And agenda, I will send that to you, Christine, but we did uh, verbally run through that. Yeah. Okay. All right, I see that we still have uh, 30 people. Uh, we've reached the public comments section. So what I'm going to do is turn this. What I'd like to do is turn this open for public comment. Because there are so many people, I'd like folks to limit their comments um, to three minutes. That is kind of a protocol for public meetings. And Christine, can you coordinate this and tee people up from your end? Yes. We have, uh we have Chris Recchi. So what I what I will tell you is, please raise your hand. Maybe Rob, you can manage this in, sure. in order. Uh, Chris Recchi rose his hand immediately. Um, Yay! So, so we'll take it in in, in order. So go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, and I guess what we can do is we have a crew here as well. We can we can alternate. But we'll start with we'll start with Chris since Chris has. Okay, be, before before we start, I'm going to apologize to my colleagues and to the public. Um, I'm in California with a deadline to vacate the premises I'm in, so I will be just hopping off here very briefly, and I'll look to the recording to catch up with all of you and see you on the 10th. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Holly. So uh, am I up, Christine? You yes, are, you're, you're up. up. Three minutes. Okay, three minutes. Cool. cool. Uh, this will be this will be really quick because I recognize there are a ton of people. I just wanted to say uh, thank you all for being willing to serve your stellar group. Um, and that includes the staff with Christine, Rob, and um, and all the folks there. Um, I do think uh, you guys are in the right place at the right time. This is critically necessary. Uh, you know. Uh, I should have said I'm managing director for ValleyNet for those that uh, don't know what I'm doing. And um, I just wanted to also say that um, very excited about you all uh, committing to this. Every two weeks is great. And um, 
and it's really important. In terms of the design and the comments I heard today, um, the high level design as well as detailed design, um, you know, ValleyNet as the design build operator for EC Fiber and now um, a few working with a few other CUDs. I just wanted to offer to you all that if it would be helpful for like a 10 minute presentation on our lessons learned uh, over the past 10 years, I would be happy to do that at any point that's helpful for you. Um, we definitely made some mistakes that we've learned from early on, and I'd like to help the other CUDs avoid those and um, and thoughts about how to make this a resilient uh, ring. There was some talk about that earlier um, to make sure that we're all, even though we may have uh, different operators and different systems and, and in some respects, different designs, there should be some standard stuff that we can agree on that will make these um, CUDs kind of integrated and uh, and make Vermont more resilient uh, as we go forward. So I'm happy to do that at any point that's useful for you, if that is. Otherwise, I just wanted to thank you and, and congratulate um, the appointments because you really are a stellar group and I know you'll do great work. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Chris. Do we have anybody in the room? And then Evan is next. Anybody in the room for three minutes? Okay. Um, I saw Evan. <laughs> okay. He's on, he's on Starlink, so he'll be, he'll be back. Yes. G give me uh, uh, some grace here because I certainly have some uh, latency that may be popping up. Um, so first uh, very excited you all together to meet uh, yeah there's a re there's a uh I mean, could you mute yourself i mean that turn your speakers off this is just set up to make the problem seem worse yeah. <laughs> evan you're uh you're getting uh, uh audio feedback through uh your speaker coupled with the microphone somewhere do we want to Evan, why don't we move to muted myself and it's coming from somewhere else. Someone else has their, their microphone unmuted. Oh yeah, we, everybody else, please mute your phones, uh, uh, mute your audio. So somebody somebody may be echoing. Okay, try again, Evan. Okay. There you go. go. Yep. Um, so first of all, thank you all for your your uh, willingness to volunteer. It's important work. Um, so really quick, one thing that has come up in discussions uh, amongst CUDs and certainly in NEK is thinking about how we are going to build in the next year and uh, the material shortage is something that is coming up frequently. Um, there has been some ideas around the idea of having the state potentially purchase uh, some percentage of fiber um, that the CUDs can then uh, access or potentially purchase. Um, but being able to buy in volume and in bulk uh, as a means to be able to kind of get in front of that material shortage if we're looking at our first major construction happening in the next uh, 12 to, to 16 months. Um, and, you know, if we're having to have to wait to purchase that, we might be pushing back our own construction timeline. But if the state has that ability to look at what all the CUDs need over the next 12 to 18 months, then there might be some discounts uh, available and certainly accessibility to those assets. So just something for potential future meetings to discuss, but wanted to put that out there. Thank you, Evan. In a minute and 10 seconds. Thank you for that as well. Um, anybody in this room? Uh, Please say your name as well. Uh, so, uh, Jonathan Baker, I'm from uh, DNAK. Um, so, I know this has been brought up by several parties before. I just wanted to bring it up again. Uh, so, our region is vast and rural and fairly poor socioeconomically. So, there's been some talk about affordability. Um, and I know it makes uh, a lot of people nervous because it's going to hurt the business case and it makes it hard to, you know, sustain, um, especially when you're running real close to the margins. Uh, but it's it's something that needs to be addressed in one way or another in the NEK or this whole thing is kind of uh, pointless up there because if you've got access to fiber, that doesn't mean you can afford it, right? If it's $120 a month, you know, I mean, what are you going to do? Uh, so, and I know that can go one of two ways, but um, you know, there's subsidies or these kind of things, but I just wanted to make sure that that's actually something that's going to be addressed and not sort of swept under the rug. 
Thank you. Um, next up, it looks like we have Irv. Irv, are you ready to give comment? Okay, anybody else online that wants to give comment at this point, or Irv, if you hear us. Okay, actually, it looks like Sean Cow. Sean, you're up. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Sean Cow. I'm the chairman of um, the Northwest CUD. Um, I just wanted to bring bring up to the attention of the board and um, uh, Christine and Rob and I um, discussed this uh, in some length this morning as well. But um, the kind of statewide need um, to develop some form of workforce development. Um, you know, from, uh, you know, the lower levels of installers and um, linemen all the way to, you know, uh, executives, you know, um, having a pipeline of qualified individuals to do this work, we're all going to kind of face that shortage. Um, and, you know, any work that the board can do to help facilitate um, the, you know, the legislature to continue to work with uh, the technical centers or VTC or any of any of those groups to um, help develop programs to um, have a skilled workforce of installers and engineers would be fantastic for all of us. Well, thank you, Sean. And which CUD are you a part of? Northwest. Thank you. Okay, back to the room here. Hey, Chris, behind you. Oh. <laughs> Uh, very briefly, I'm uh, Chris Campbell. Um, I'm with uh, Tilson, and um, also we're doing some consulting work with um, Vermont Electric uh, Cooperative to see how they can help support broadband deployment um, in, in a very rural part of the state. Um, and just to that uh, to that point, very briefly, um, you know, I think there's a, a great opportunity to build on some of the support that Vermont's electric utilities have already provided um, to broadband deployment to both. You know, further the goals of the state, make those dollars that are coming into the state go further, um, and also, you know, get a smarter, more resilient electric grid um, as a result of that. So um, I just encourage uh, efforts to include the, uh, you know, the consultation with the electric utilities. Our, our experience so far is that there's you know, a lot of goodwill there um, and, and willingness to, to cooperate. Thank, Thank you, Chris. Chris. And I believe, I believe Irv came Irv back, came back in. Yep. Um, if you're ready, Herb, if not, we will go to Jane. I, okay, Jane, you're up. Thank you. I'm Jane, well, I'm chair of Oil Fiber Net. I'm getting an echo and you're getting it too. My apologies. Um, I want to thank you all for serving and I want to thank Rob, Representative Cabelia, and, and many others who brought us to this point. Um, I echo what many others have said. And I just want to add one thing, and that is, as you're thinking about the ways to support the CUDs, let's keep in mind what VCUDA can do better and what the VCBB can do better uh, in terms of collaboration, et cetera. I just want to see duplication of effort there. That's it, and thank you very much. Thank you, Jane. Oops. Okay, in the room, anybody else? Irv's still not available. Irv's having some trouble, we're going back and forth. So if there's, yeah, okay, I think I, you're up. Uh, <laughs> Madam Chair, is it possible to relax the three minute now that you have uh, a sense of, or no, you got 10 minutes left. Yeah. Um, first off, I'd like to, uh, say that maybe we should consider referring to this as uh, essential infrastructure rather than critical so as not to confuse it with the Belco and, and Department of Homeland Security's definition of critical infrastructure. Um, that's a semantics thing that the workforce training somebody brought up uh, is authorized for some of this 150 million to be uh, allocated to and a number of folks have recognized that that's going to be one of the big bottlenecks in addition to uh, potentially uh, materials. Uh, 
getting that on first priority to work with Vermont Tech or other institutions to develop training programs, possibly even a national training center uh, that could bring folks to Vermont to be trained. And if we're lucky enough to uh, poach them uh, for in-state builds, we'll reimburse their sending utility uh, for their training costs. But we, we need to get both linemen, wireless tower uh, infrastructure, uh, cross-trained line persons for fiber and electric uh, to staff up. I believe our best shot at getting this done the, the statutory goal is every E911 address having fiber speeds by the end of 2024. I beg that you look at that closely and not just kick it out seven years and not only look at the addresses that are unserved by cable today. If we're going to strictly adhere to the statutory goal, we need to have a plan that's going to reach the cable served addresses as well with fiber. The statutory goal also requires competition. And these are some critical path factors that are going to determine how we go about this. We do not want to just patch together a bunch of disparate designs from CUDs and build a Frankenstein that is not as resilient and interoperable and utility grade and public safety grade as we need in Vermont. We have one shot at this amount of money. Uh, it looks like $100 billion per state from the bill they're debating today in Congress. Uh, 100 million remaining for next year's ARPA, 150 million already authorized, 18 million spent, and there's 37 and a half million in uh, Northern Borders Regional Commission for for infrastructure. So with that amount of money, we need to think uh, about doing that statewide design in order to. You're trying to cut me off. No, I'm trying to tell you that it's, it's three minutes now. I'll get, take another 30 seconds. I, I can't compress what I have. I've got 30 years experience working on telecom plans. We have a failed telecom plan. This body needs to adhere to the goals of 202C, which necessitate mobile wireless coverage, competition, open access, be integrated into all your plan approvals. There is a section in the bill for the statewide design to contract for a comprehensive statewide fiber optic engineering design to identify strategies to maximize fiber optic build out efficiency, ensure resiliency and interoperability of all existing fiber optic networks built with public or rate payer funds. And that needs to be one of your highest priorities because that would need to be completed by year end. Well, th thank you, Steve. I encourage you to submit more in writing. I know you have a lot more to say and to be able just to, to save you know. <laughs> Chief, and just Chief. for the record, it's uh, Steve, can you just announce your full name and who you are with, who you're working on behalf? Steve Whitaker, I'm an independent citizen. Thank you. I think I think Jane still has her hand up. So I, think, I think Jane didn't put her. Jane, I think you all are all set. Irv, are you back? He was trying to figure out how to unmute his microphone. Um, I may be able to do that for him if I can find him on here. Um, if not, Irv, if you, you can also try to call in as well, but let me, I'm actually not seeing him. I'm going to see if I can unmute him directly. If his audio on his laptop is muted, you cannot unmute that. Yeah, so it's not even, it's not giving me the option to mute him, so. Um, Change, try changing Irv to an attendee to see if that helps. If not, Irv, you're going to have to to figure it out, figure out on your screen. Or maybe type it in the chat. Maybe type your comment in the chat and we can read it aloud. So maybe what we have him do is just write his comments down and submit them after the fact. Okay. Okay. He says something. He's talking about detailed design. It's hard to type in three minutes what you want to say in chat function. <laughs> okay. Is, is there anyone else in the chat that would like to offer comment?
Okay, he said, so here's what Irv, Irv has to say about detailed design. He says, beware of imposing the same level of detail across the entire uh, state, uh, C, uh, all the CUDs. Uh, thank, Great. Thanks, well, Irv. So turn it back to you, Patty, for next steps and I guess closing the meeting. Okay, um, I want to thank everybody that um, attended today, both on the board, staff, and the public. We're looking forward to kicking this off um, and doing deep dive and really getting in, you know, getting going with the deployment of funds here and really look forward to a collaborative process and full transparency and uh, excited that our first meeting went so well. I think we got a lot done today and it's very efficient. Any uh, comments, closing comments from any board members? Christine? Uh, no, no final comments. I'm very satisfied. I'll like you say it was a great meeting. Good job, good job, Patty. Good job, board. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Very much. We'll Rob, do you have any other further comments? I would just say we, we will work on the on the agenda uh, and post it to all the appropriate places later this afternoon to ensure proper notice. Excellent. Thank you very much. And with that, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Excellent. All those in favor, say aye. All right, all right. All right. We are adjourned. Thank you all, and we will see you next week on the 10th at 830. Thank okay, you, great. Thank you.